All right, it is one o'clock in Atlanta and we are ready to get going. Uh, so real quick, I'd like to thank all of our sponsors who have been with us through this transition to a virtual conference. Uh, they've been super supportive. At Diamond Level, we have Warner Media, Gold Level, Kennesaw State University, Coles College, and the KSU Department of Information Systems, Bishop Fox, Coal Fire, Genuine Parts Company, and NCR. At Crystal Level, we've got Critical, Critical Path and Synopsis, Silver Level, Aaron's, Binary Defense, Black Hills, Corelight, and GuidePoint Security. Bronze Level, we have NCC Group, and our in-kind sponsors are EC Council for Online Training and Secure Code Warrior for the virtual CTF. Uh, we'd also like to thank Crosshair Information Technology, Joe Gray, Offensive Security, and Pentester Lab for their contributions to our raffle prizes. Make sure to go to the raffle giveaways channel and get signed up for those. There are some really great prizes. Um, if you haven't done it already, uh, we'd like you to drop a pin on our map just so we can get an idea of where everybody's coming from. I'll post a link to that in the Track Protect channel in a minute. Uh, and yeah, without further ado, I will pass it off to Oscar and Brandon. Hey, everybody. Um, thanks, Patrick, for the introduction. And thank you, Besides, for having us. It's been an, uh, an interesting transition, definitely going to uh, everything virtual lately. So glad to be here. Um, I'm going to make sure that first we can see my screen. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Perfect. All right, so welcome to the Expose Yourself Without Insecurity talk. Um, so during this talk, we're trying to answer the question, um, how do you determine what your exposure is on on cloud infrastructure? Like what is your publicly facing external infrastructure for the cloud accounts within your organization? Um, my name is Oscar Salazar, I'm a principal researcher at Mr. Fox. This is Brandon Gaudet. He is also um, working on the continuous attack surface testing team at Bishop Fox. And we've been working on techniques and procedures and tools to help improve that process and, and improve that system. So yeah, uh, I'll jump in. Um, so before we kind of go into the cloud and what your cloud exposes on the public internet, um, the first thing you kind of have to do is define what is an asset inventory and what is it ex what is the six X criteria to define that you your asset inventory is what you want it to be and is doing what you need it to do. Um, so during our work, we've kind of stepped down and took a step back and looked at this and kind of, what do we want out of it? What is it going to do for us? And what does it need to have in order to do that? Um, and those kind of break down into your, some of your standards and some new approaches that we're taking. So the first one is just that it is complete and accurate. Um, you don't want to be tracking assets that you no longer own because you could waste your time tracking down vulnerabilities or different types of um, problems. And you also, it's only as good as how accurate it is because you only need to miss one asset on one subsidiary that has a critical vulnerability in order for you to feel like your asset inventory failed you or wasn't good enough in doing what you wanted it to do because you essentially weren't tracking something that was critical to your company's infrastructure. Um, so then once you have this base of an accurate inventory, kind of like what is the next step? And for us, it was kind of take a different approach than kind of the old school approaches you do a pen test once a year and you kind of redefine your assets every so X months, depending on your company and organization, into having a continuously updated set of assets. At any point in time, if I have a question that I want to know about my exposure to the internet for my organization, I want to be able to go to this asset inventory and just be able to ask it. So that means you have to update that inventory at a 
quicker time period. It can't be every year. You should try to get it down to monthly or weekly or even daily um, in some cases. So depending on your organization or your kind of your level of security, you kind of want to reduce that time to as low as possible so that anytime you do have a question, you can go and ask it. And then kind of the last big thing was the thing I want to use my asset inventory for is to ask questions about it. So we kind of need to improve the data. We don't want just a list of assets or like a list of domain IPs and CIDR ranges. When I have a question about my exposure on the internet or what assets do I own, I mostly want to be able to answer a specific question as in, hey, do I have this type of asset on my network? And just having a domain list or IP address kind of isn't enough to answer those questions. So we want to move the data that is in our inventory assets to something that's more actionable. Don't just have domains or IPs or CIDR ranges. Kind of scan those and see what ports are open or what services are running on them or any other kind of data. What, is, what do they resolve to? What name servers they're using? In order to kind of have a better picture of what that inventory actually means and then be able to action on it and have the data that's required to action. Um, so kind of breaking those three things down, if you can do all of them, and kind of doing them continuously and over time and always be able to ask them a specific question. Essentially, that would define a very successful inventory that if I have a question, I can go and ask it, I can get an answer. And then I know that when I'm asking it a question that I'm getting the correct answer and that it's accurate. Um, and, for, and for our perspective, we focus, we tend to focus on external attack surfaces, which ends up being like your targets, right? So a target would be a scheme host port combination an IP address and a way to interact with it. Um, that's really what we're trying to target here. So, right, so, yeah, the, yeah. so the way that we tackle this um, at, at Bishop Fox is that we try to start with building a baseline. And in order to build a good baseline, we take a couple different approaches. The first thing that we wanna try to do is identify a brand, right? What is your organization's brand? What are all of the things associated with your organization? And start moving from there. Um, we want to evaluate what your brand has, what organization structure, what's the org structure uh, within this company? What business units do they have? Do they have any specific products that they um, that they service or sell? And are do they are they large enough to have like a mergers and acquisitions? Uh, be part of that uh, infrastructure. The Within those business units and different portions of the organization, we try to start tracking different types of assets. So pr their primary domains, any subdomains associated with those domains, uh, your IP address space, like a CIDR range, uh, active services that they may host or may um, may have as part of their infrastructure and any ASNs that would be associated with that. And in addition to that, making sure that, again, we're continuously updating that data with new DNS information, new records if, as they come up, making sure that the domains that we're tracking are up to date as, as organiza organizations purchase new ones or as they uh, relinquish the old ones that they're no longer using and making sure that we have a accurate set of CIDR ranges so that when we're discussing what your attack surface is, we know the correct set of IPs as ASN will change, um, can change over time. So yeah, as Oscar stated, we do this at Bishop Box right now as a completely external perspective, but there's kind of a second way of doing this and that's kind of where this presentation is gonna be pushing trying to push towards going towards. And that is from a defensive standpoint, you have access to more data than you do from an external standpoint. You have access to master records for DNS. You have access directly to your cloud accounts, um, which we'll get into a lot more detail later. So you have a different view on your network from the inside than you do the outside, which gives you, once again, access to more data and a different way to try to find these domains and a different understanding of how the organization works in order to do it. So listed below is a couple examples, I already named some DNS records, domain registrars, um, scanning, um, stuff just your internal IT team will know about the organization that is not might not necessarily be public. 
um, just like proprietary information or just kind of common knowledge within an organization is also very different than what you know as an external. Um, and all of this can be used to find domains that are different than you would find on an, on an external attack surface. Um, so you should be using both. This is kind of the second approach of, of doing that. So here we're gonna start talking about kind of the methodology that we think makes the most sense when you're trying to create a complete inventory of your externally accessible targets. You gotta look at it from, from both sides, right? From the inside looking out and from the outside looking in. For the inside looking out, kind of like we just discussed, you have access to master records. You have access to basically the source of truth for the information, right? If I'm trying to identify all the subdomains on, uh, on a domain that belongs to your organization from an external perspective, I have a, a limited set of resources and I have to essentially guess at what subdomains may be um, and, and try to find records. From an internal perspective, you have access to your, your DNS zones and you have access to all the subdomains that are in fact there. So you have a more complete view from the outside. Uh, on the flip side though, from as an internal, um, as someone looking from the inside, you only know what you know, right? So you, you have access to the records, you can query the systems that you know about, you can pull that information, but shadow IT exists in, in many organizations and we, we've seen companies, customers tell us, well, we have no uh, AWS infrastructure, for example. And then during the assessment, we break into their AWS infrastructure. And so it turns out that somebody at the organization, a higher up had created an account and we were able to correlate that data and find their essentially shadow IT, right? So you can only protect what you know about and that's why we, we also want to look at it from the outside in, right? Uh, red team, uh, red teamers and, and OSINT techniques can be used to help identify assets that you own that you are unaware of. Yeah, so this is kind of an example of what we did one on our customers. We took the outside in approach while gathering, asking our customer to hand us all of the inside out approach. So in this case, they handed us 4,300 and 81 domains that they knew about um, from an inside perspective. And then we did the outside protective scan of doing a full deep dive into the organization, its acquisitions and subsidiaries, and doing our own identification. And we ended up with 11,191 domains. Um, out of those, some might not have been there. So we had 79, about, uh, roughly 8,000 high confidence. So what we mean by high, high confidence here is those domains are correlated with multiple data points that belong to the company. So it could be like they have their name server and their screenshot looks like them or something. They essentially have more than one data point that makes us believe that it belongs to the company where we have some medium confidence domains. There's just over 3000 that just kind of have one data point. Um, might be who is data, might be something else where it could be somebody else just trying to act like them or it might just not be them anymore. Um, but there still looks like them, it just might not be them. And then when we combine this data, you kind of get that we, from an external perspective, only missed 24 domains. Well, they end up missing from an internal perspective, 11,000 domains, but how many domains here is not necessarily important, kind of what to pull out of this slide and what matters is that neither approach was good enough to find all of the domains. Um, so we ended up missing 24 domains and while digging into those domains, we realized they had things like protected privacy who is data and did have data directly correlated to the company or any of its acquisitions. So those type of domains are gonna be almost impossible to find from an external perspective because they have nothing that's tying them to the company. But from an internal perspective, they had records showing that they owned it and they host it or that they control what it's doing, um, which is not something that you'll ever find from the external. Where for this organization, they had a lot of the shadow IT or the security team had acquisitions that they didn't know about. Where when we looked at it from an external perspective, their security team, essentially the org itself was behind because this company acquires a lot. And we found domains that were associated with acquisitions that they weren't necessarily tracking. That infrastructure wasn't pulled into their security team yet, so they just weren't tracking it. Um, but yeah, the, 
thing to kind of take away from this is that neither approach is good enough to find all of it, but if we kind of can take both approaches at the same time, we'll have a better understanding of the total external attack surface or asset management of, a, of an organization. So let's say that now you've gone through the process, you're convinced that you want to use the, outs, uh, the inside out approach, right? H how do you find all of the AWS accounts that you own? We have some customers that have hundreds of AWS accounts and they need to track all of those. How do you find shadow IT uh, within your organization? And one technique is to follow the money, right? So uh, talk to your finance group, see if anybody has put credit card charges for AWS on their, um, on their cards and try to track those people down and try to get access to, um, to that data or visibility into their accounts. One thing to, to note is that, you know, just because you're looking for AWS Azure or like Google Cloud Compute, that's not necessarily all the different ways that Shadow IT can come up. There are additional, you know, SaaS services um, that can also create AWS accounts for you or cloud accounts for you that wouldn't show up on, on that. So just be aware for that, about that. So once you've collected uh, information about all the accounts that you wanna have access to, how do you manage that? And, and I think the answer is you create one more account, <laughs> which is the one that has access from like a read only access auditor role to, um, to get insight into all the accounts that you have identified. So then, yeah, once, even once you have the accounts, then the next questions are like, what do you do with those accounts or what do you care about? Um, so we kind of boil it down into a few pieces of information. Once you have access to an account, there's kind of different information you can pull out of these cloud providers. Um, so, and depending on your access level and what you can do and what services you're using, it'll all change. It kind of boils down to a couple of different things. So, so you have your internally facing stuff, um, which should only be ac accessed internally, um, but you can be misconfigured VPCs and other things, so that that's not necessarily the case. But there's the internal side, um, there's, and also the internet side. So some services create, like an S3, will create a, essentially a link to the outside internet um, where people can access it from the external. And then there's kind of the in-between. There's different services you can set up in between that will link the internal to external or just can be done. Um, something we did look into is uh, the AWS resource relationships. So there's something now called IAM Access Analyzer, which is something that looks at your infrastructure and determines that. So it can help you determine if those internal things are publicly facing or um, any type of those misconfigurations are happening on the internal system. Um, yeah, so, so some in some cases you can configure um, like AWS, for example, to give any other account within AWS at all, not within your organization, just any AWS account access to your data. Uh, that's not really what we're focusing on for this talk. We're really focusing on from the external perspective, internet facing systems. So when we're looking at this, the types of data that we're trying to collect here are associated with um, host names, which is whether it be a, a DNS record or an IP address, um, what ports are being exposed on that infrastructure, what, what protocol is being used to interact with it, are there any relative paths that may be relevant when you're accessing it. So in some cases, like if you're doing a, a Lambda and you're putting it behind an API gateway, then it is a host name plus a path in order to access that content. So making sure that you have the kind of the re relevant contextual knowledge of how to inter interact with that system. Um, <clears throat> and one of the interesting things to note for cloud services in particular is that there's a lot of vhosting or like multi-honing of these systems. So if you just scan the internet for an IP on an IP basis, you will not reach the correct backend application that's serving your data in a lot of cases, right? If you have an EC2 box, then that has a, an IP address that's assigned just to you. But if you are using S3, for example, you, you won't really access it by IP address. You won't get to this, this system that you're trying to, to target. So when we started this, uh, we were trying to answer that question, right? What systems are exposed to the internet? Um, 
when when we were looking at this, you know, the, the number of services that AWS housed in 2011 or yeah, in 2011, it was like a handful, right? You could look at them, you could count them very easily. Uh, in 2017, that number kind of exploded. The numbers continued to go up. Um, every year, they, they release new, uh, like several new services, and it becomes harder and harder to keep track of which one of those services have publicly facing data and which one of those services have um, uh, expose you on the internet. So some of the previous research that we looked into, there was Cloud Mapper, um, AWS Public IPs, which was linked from Cloud Mapper, uh, AIM Access Analyzer, which we discussed a little bit earlier, and Cartography, which was a tool by Lyft that kind of did a couple, a little bit of everything. Uh, some of the problems that we had with those is that it wasn't comprehensive. It didn't have access to all the different endpoints, just a very select few. Uh, not all, yeah, so not all services were covered. Some of them had port information, some of them didn't. Some of them had protocol information, some of them didn't. Uh, some of them focused on access control lists and none of them did exactly what we needed. So our, our first pass at this was going through the, um, looking on the internet for what are the URL structures or the access patterns that you can use in order to um, get access to this data. So uh, first we went to the Guru, uh, uh, API's Guru and found some information that seemed to be updated fairly often about what AWS services were available and in within there, what the URLs were. And we use that to perform some analysis using like passive DNS data to see what kind of data you could get access to. Here's some examples that we put together of how it is, how the domains are, are structured. Um, skip this part based on time. So here's some example of exposed elastic search indexes that contain sensitive data that you can access only by hitting the correct host name. If you access these by IP address, it doesn't work. You can't scan for these with an, with an old method of, of scanning IP only, right? You need host names. So making sure that you can find these on your environment helps you protect yourself. Uh, same with another example was the media, uh, media store, which allows you to watch videos or post videos through AWS. Um, we found patterns that allowed us to access channels that were supposed to be paid channels or, or part of the Samsung library of TV channels that we were able to access without owning a Samsung TV. So our, our current solution now is to create another tool, um, introducing small cloud, right? Which is essentially a tool to help you identify and pull out all the host names, IP addresses and, um, and URIs that are publicly exposed on your AWS infrastructure. Brian, do you want to uh, yes. talk a little bit about it? Yeah, so big thing here is um, kind of, we found out the same problem of which ones do we actually want to look at. Um, so we looked at uh, the example documentation with the AWS CLI and did some grep commands um, and try to understand what ones was returning data sets we wanted, either domains or IPs. Um, and after enumerating them, you end up with a much smaller list than the thousands or hundreds um, of different services that are available in AWS. Um, so at that point, you then have to take a deeper look. So we essentially integrated those. I think the next slide shows it. We ended up with 288 endpoints across 62 services that returned either host names, URIs, or IPs. Um, from that, we could see that there was X services. So we started manually and going through each service and looking at these endpoints to identify which ones would disclose it and how. Um, so so far, we've gone through 14 services, um, like including like API Gateway, CloudFront, S3, and wrote tooling that could be easily extendable in order to pull the correct information out of those services that would be publicly facing and interesting to look at from an external perspective. Um, so. Yeah, and so there's a couple of tricky things, right? The 62 services uh, are only ones that returned 
like fully formed host names, URIs, or IPs, but there's also services that don't return that information. So like example, for an example, S3, it'll give you your bucket name, but not the full URL. So there's still additional combing that needs to be performed through uh, the 194 services that are available. But uh, I think this is a good start. We've created, we've uh, pushed the code to the repo and, and put some documentation there. You can run it and, and see the outcome for URIs, IPs, and host names on your external infrastructure or externally facing cloud. Um, and, and past that, you know, we're working towards getting a more and more comprehensive list to, to wrap up our, our view of what your external attack surface is when looking at an AWS account. Yeah, um, thank you for listening. Uh, I know we had to go through the end fast due to time. Um, if anyone has any questions, we'll be around to answer those via, via the Slack channel or um, any type of messaging system.